This is the Auto Body Podcast, presented by Clarity Co. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. I have a very exciting show today. Um, this guest has been requested many, many different times and has actually been recommended to me by previous guests many, many times. And uh, you guys are probably, the man needs no real introduction, but I'm going to do it anyways. We have Mike Anderson, formerly of Wagon Work Collision Center, and it is now the president and owner of Collision Advice Consulting Services. Mike, how are you doing today? Uh, pleasure is totally mine, sir. Um, okay, so Mike, how we usually like to start off the show is we really like to try and, you know, get some history on you. What was what was young Mike like? Was he always into cars? Did he always dream about being an auto body tech? Like what was what was the what was young Mike like? Yeah, so um, you know, my dad was a uh, he was a body technician at a dealership body shop called Heichmann's Porsche Audi Volkswagen BMW. And so I grew up every summer, you know, when I was out of school, you know, I'd go there and wash cars and empty trash cans and sweep the floors and and then my dad did a lot of like side work in a garage behind her house. So, you know, I kind of grew up, you know, every summer working with my dad. And then when I graduated high school, I went in the military. Um, I actually graduated high school at 17 and I went to uh, the military because I always wanted to go to the military. My dad's a, he was a disabled vet from Vietnam. And so, you know, I just want to go to the military and follow his footsteps. So I went to the military and um, while I was in the military, because I really loved the military and um, I was going to college at night because my goal was to get out of the military finish up my degree and go back in the military as an officer. So when I got out of the military, I still needed to finish up my degree. So I was working with my dad and my dad and I worked at a dealership shop and um, there was a falling out with some of the dealership principals. And uh, what happened was uh, the dealership ended up changing hands and the opportunity came up where my dad and I um, could actually purchase the body shop. So, um, my plans changed and I didn't go back in the military. And, uh, next thing you know, I'm working with my dad and, uh, we were, I was just helping him to, to do body work. And, uh, there was a manager that ran the store and he decided to part ways. And, uh, my dad just said, Hey, you know, you write the neatest and can use a calculator. So would you go in the office? And so I went in the office and I had never written an estimate a day in my life, but I knew back then that we used what was called the Mitchell books, right? This was before computer estimating software. So I took the book and I just read it and it just said, these are the things you can charge for and things that are included, not included. So I, I went out the next day. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard that saying, ignorance is bliss. Oh, but ignorance, that's how I live my life is yeah, ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> ignorance was, was bliss for me because I didn't have anybody brainwash me and say like, an insurance company won't pay for this, right? So I just started writing estimates based on what the book said. And obviously I quickly found out that, you know, third party payers didn't always want to pay what it took to fix the car, but I didn't get offended by it. I just assumed they were uneducated. So then I kind of adopted a premise in my life called educate, not alienate, right? So fast forward, um, I uh, bought my dad out in 2000 and then opened up a second shop in 2002 and a third one in 2005. Our wow. shops were in Alexander, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, we were the second all aluminum Audi certified shop in North America. That was back like when you had to send your technicians to Germany. We were Porsche certified. We were factory trained for BMW and Toyota at the time because you couldn't be certified unless you were owned by a dealership. But we uh, really um, had a lot of you know insurance, I mean, I'm sorry, a lot of OEM certifications. When DRPs first came out, you know, we signed up for them because they were new. Nobody really knew what a DRP was. And we were a DRP for a number of years, but we eventually just came to a crossroads where we felt like we couldn't serve two masters, right? And we wanted to focus on doing things right according to the OEM certification. And so what we did is we um, eventually, you know, we weren't anti-insurance. We were just pro-fix the car right. And we just marketed our business and focused on really growing our business. So what was young Mike like growing up? Um, you know, I just, I grew up in the business with my dad and, you know, grew up, um, you know, riding motorcycles or mini bikes, I guess you called them at the time. And uh, my first car, you know, my dad worked at a, a German dealership, again, that sold Porsches, Audis, Volkswagens, and BMW. So all my friends were driving cool Camaros and Novas. I was driving a 73 Volkswagen Super Beetle with a 1600 CCC engine, which doesn't sound as cool. So, you know, that was kind of how I got my start in the industry. And then uh, in 2010, um, I made a decision to sell my businesses not because we weren't successful, but actually let me back up a little bit. When I had my shops, um, I was in a 20 group called the Coyote Vision Group. 
and with Elena Satchery, who was a great mentor to my to me. And when I was in the 20 group, we were always one of the highest performers in regards to estimatics KPIs. And so Elena asked me if I would do an estimating seminar, and I did. I'd never done a seminar before, and I did it, and people like liked it. And I was like, wow. So next thing you know, other people said, hey, can you do a seminar for us here or there? So I actually started doing consulting and training even when I owned my businesses, right? I started doing consulting and training probably in about 1996. And I did that even when I had my shops. But I just really found that my passion, it was very fulfilling and gratifying to me to just to work with people and see their businesses improve. So in 2010, I sold my businesses and that's when we started Collision Advice. And, uh, and now Collision Advice today, um, you know, we do all the factory training for Toyota Lexus for estimating, for, which is mandated for their certification. We do all the mandated estimate training for Nissan Infiniti. We do estimate training for Honda Acura. We do the mandated estimate training for Porsche. But Collision Vice isn't just Mike Anderson. I mean, we've got, um, you know, 11 employees. And we also go into shops and help shops improve their processes. And then we also do 20 groups, which is where people that are not competitors get together on a quarterly basis. And we just kind of help them improve their businesses. So, you know, we, we're kind of all things. But uh, that's that's the, I guess that was a long, short story about how I got in the industry and what I was like growing up as a kid. That's that's okay. I'm sure you've probably told this story several times, so you've mm. got, probably got it down pat. Sure. Uh, it's my job to kind of dig into the details and no get worries. in there a little bit. No worries. Um, so going back to when you were a kid, that had to have been something really neat to see your dad. Let's I don't know if your dad actually did this, but let's say take a wrecked BMW, Porsche, something like yeah. that, and yeah. watch him restore it and get it to the part point where like it's drivable again, it looks new again and everything that had to have left a pretty good impression on you. Um, yeah, it, it did, you know, um, you know, I think back in the day and I'm not saying it was right, but it wasn't uncommon for a lot of technicians to, um, you know, get totals and rebuild them. Right. That's not as prominent today. And, and it's a different day and time. Right. But yeah, my dad did that. Um, it was kind of unfortunate. My mom had a lot of health issues when I was growing up and my mom spent a lot of my childhood in the hospital, unfortunately. And so my dad, he didn't just like do side work and fix red cars on the side when he wasn't working at the shop at, because like he wanted to, it was like necessity to provide for our family and help pay for my mom's medical bills and stuff. So you know, um, but yeah, it was very, you know, I'd see my dad take a car and, um, you know, just restored all, you know, all the way. And, um, and, and, you know, I mean, I've seen put it like a roof on a car and, and again, he, I mean, he just, he, he worked really hard. My dad came from, uh, he was one of nine kids and he was, uh, they were very, very poor. And my dad forged his birth certificate when he was 16 years old to go to the military to send money back to take care of his, uh, brothers and sisters. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was really cool to see my dad do that. You know, my dad was like a lot of people back in that day and age, you know, uh, where he did the body work, paint work, everything. And, um, and at the dealership they worked at, um, my dad worked at, he was actually the Porsche, like, well, all the body techs fixed, like Porsches, Audis, Volkswagen's, BMWs. My dad was the only one that did the Porsches there. So, mm-hmm. you know, I really saw the, uh, you know, the order 914s and the 911s and the turbos and the 944s. So but it, yeah, it was really cool just to see what my dad did. And it's so funny because like my dad unfortunately passed away in May just here recently. And, you know, I, I just remember like when my dad would hammer and dolly on something, just the movement of his wrist. And it's just, it's, it's etched in my mind forever, just the, the way he did it and how he would make some of his own tools. And, um, you know, but, but absolutely, it was back to your question. It was pretty amazing just to, to see what my dad could do and, and how he fixed things. It was pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, Speaking of the Porsches, just to have a little bit of a lighter note, um, we just released a, the episode for Sarah DeCarmen, who is um, L.A. Dismantler. Yes. And um, I told her on the podcast, I said, you know, a little bit of an embarrassing fact, but I have absolutely zero idea how Porsche, the naming structure works. Like yes. someone tells me a 996, 911 GT so 9, RS, and I'm right, like, right, yeah. I, I sure I have zero idea in what year that po- that Porsche was made like just no idea whatsoever so she uh she gave me a little bit of advice on on that um yeah it's a, actually I have a a 73 Porsche 914 2 liter it was my car I had when I was in the military and when I was in the military one of the places I was stationed at it would get really hot and the 914 was a mid-engine vehicle and it was fuel injected so it would vapor lock a lot because it was mm. really hot where I lived at in Missouri at the time 
So I got frustrated and sold the car. And um, my father, many years later, um, found the lady I had sold it to, and it was in a barn. So I got it back and disassembled it and um, took it and had it chemically stripped and then epoxy primed the whole thing. And and I've got a, a good friend of mine, Donald Hughes, who's been helping me to kind of redo it and uh, actually hoping to paint that thing uh, here in the next week or two and then uh, put sprayable sealer and sealer on the underside and everything and then go paint it and then put it back together. So it's been a project car for a long time, but it's kind of cool to get the car back that I had when I was in the military. It's the actual same car, you know? Man, that is actually really neat. Are you yeah. going to make sure that it still keeps the vapor lock function of it? Just, uh, just for old kicks? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I, I they've met, you know some people switch them over to carburetors, which I'm not going to do because I want to try to keep it original, but there are some kits where you can relocate the fuel pump up front in the front area and so I, I may consider doing that we'll see it doesn't get as hot around here where i'm at as where i was stationed at at the time but uh just looking forward to getting it they're fun little cars you know kind of yeah some people call them the poor man's porsche but uh it's all going back original same color and everything and uh i don't know if you know jake rodenrath who was with aztec who's now with lucid uh but he's a huge uh like you know porsche fan and and uh you know he has a 914 a couple 914s as well so I'm sure him and I'll get together and, and tell lies and stories once I get it all done. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what what branch of military were you going to go into? So I was actually in the air. I went in the Air Force. I oh, started okay. out. Um, I originally um, starting. I was in the Air Force and I started out um, doing security for Minuteman missiles in uh, Non Nostra, Missouri, at Whiteman Air Force Base. Um, at one time, the United States military had a lot of Titan and Minuteman missiles underground. And so um, they would always swap the warheads and satellite heads out so the Russians would never know which ones to target and attack. So we would provide security when they were swapping those out. And then also those silos were under the ground, but they had above ground alarm systems. And if the alarm systems went out, we had to go there and provide security until they fixed the alarm. So I did that for a few years. And then um, what I did is I transferred to Andrew, I transferred to Andrews Air Force Base and I was assigned to the security detail for Air Force One with President Reagan. So wow. got to serve what I believe is probably one of the best presidents we've ever had and uh, got to travel with Air Force One and provide security. And I actually stayed in the active reserves when I got out of the Air Force because, again, I got out with the intention of getting my degree and going back in. So I actually, I was active duty and then uh, actually ended up going into active reserves, just still with Air Force One. And uh, it was a great career. I got to meet at that time President Reagan and um, Vice President Bush at the time, and um, and then their wives, and uh, it was, so that was my job in the Air Force. It was a great thing. It's kind of funny because a lot of the um, I was telling somebody actually this morning at an airport, I ran into a gentleman named Michael from BMW at the airport this morning because I just flew him from Milwaukee, and we were, he was in the Marines, and uh, he was asking me like, "How did you get assigned to Air Force One?" And what happened was there was a uh, a colonel that was stationed where I was at at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri, and we had a hobby shop. And people found out that I could fix cars. So all the officers and everybody would always be asking me, hey, can you come to the hobby shop and do this for me? So, and then he got transferred to Andrews and he's like, I'm taking you with me. So that's how I ended up going to Air Force One, right? Is because wow. uh, of my ability to be able to fix his car on the side. So it was pretty funny. <laughs> um, we actually, uh, so I live in South Dakota and we have a yeah. fair amount of those Minuteman uh, missile sites. Um, I have absolutely zero idea where one is, but um, I was originally I was originally assigned to uh, Minot Air Force Base. We used to call it White Out Minot in North Dakota, and uh, there was a guy that was in my um, uh, like my flight, and he was from North Dakota. So we did a swap, and that's how I ended up in Missouri. So, um, but so, yeah, yeah, familiar <laughs> with that North Dakota, South Dakota, and uh, although I got to tell you the the body shops when I look at like which shops get paid the most to fix cars in the entire United States of America. It's usually North Dakota and South Dakota are on like the top five oh, right? Right. Of, of states. Yeah, and I think it's because there's not as much competition out there. Shops are a little bit more spread out than versus like a major metropolitan area like Miami, Florida, or Washington, D.C. So, you know, the insurers can't always just have a car, a shop down the street that's willing to take it, right? So kudos to those shops in North and South Dakota because they, they truly... Uh, get probably paid more to fix cars than all the other states. Yeah, I would say, so I live in Sioux Falls, which is the largest city in South Dakota. And even in, even here, which, you know, I'm going to say the population and which people will laugh at, but whatever, but the <laughs> population, we're probably sitting around um, 350 now with, if you include like kind of like the suburb area. Yes. Um, and there's not a ton of 
commercial body shops, you know, like um, col- straight up collision repair and everything like that. Um, there's actually a decent amount of like custom shops sure. with hot rods sure. and stuff like that. Sure. Um, but I can really only think of like five or six shops that are straight up collision repair. Sure. Um, well, no, that's not necessarily true because the dealerships have some of the mostly their own body shops, but sure. they're without without being too nasty there's there's only some of them that you would actually go to because the other ones they do not do that good of work um but yeah like you're absolutely right like as an example so between sioux falls and the next town it's like a hundred miles um so and there's only going to be like one or two body shops in that town so they can just command whatever price they want yeah i mean it definitely makes a difference in regards to population and you know how many shops are in that area etc so yeah so it's it's funny, I had, um, up until about, um, I'd say about, up until, I'd say right but like around 2019, um, I had been to every state in the United States doing consulting and seminars and training except for South Dakota. And I think it was uh, 2018, 2019, I got the opportunity to go do a seminar in uh, South Dakota and there was a major snowstorm and I was actually stuck at my hotel for like four days before I could even get out. Yep. Couldn't get a rental car, couldn't do anything. So I was like, I appreciated South Dakota. And I've been back a couple of times since and everybody there is very kind and very welcoming. So it's, I've, that's I've what we're known for it. being nice. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot um, what, what, uh, what city were you in? What town were you in when you, when you did that? Uh, first so trip? I was just in Sioux Falls, like literally like, like two months ago, I think about two mm-hmm. months ago, maybe three months ago, I was in Sioux Falls. But um, back then, I don't recall what city I was in. It was a couple of years ago, so I don't recall. But that's okay. I mean, yeah. if you were fl- if you flew in, it was either Rapid City or Sioux Falls. Like, yeah, Pier has an airport, but not really. You know. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, so enough enough with the uh, South Dakotas because that's not what uh, oh, no worries <laughs> people are here to listen to. Um, okay, so. I'm actually curious. Okay. You go from, you're working with your dad, you're, you're in your single shop, you buy them out in 2000, you said, and then in Oh two, I think you said you, you started up your second location. What was, what was that process like for you? Like what were some of the learning experiences you had from that? So, um, when I had my first shop, we always had about a a one to two month backlog worth of work. I mean, for like almost two years straight. And we had a lot of really good young technicians who had trained other young technicians, right? Um, And there wasn't a place for them to work in our shop because we were maxed out, but they had, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They, They had excelled at their training and they were ready to be technicians on their own. So I said, you know what, let me just go open up another shop. And uh, it actually was only about five, four or five blocks from my main location, right? And so um, I went there and um, I bought an existing body shop that was like just a pigsty. And we basically demolished the whole building and just went and built it from scratch and laid it out the way we wanted it. And, um, and so it was really just because we always had a backlog of work. And um, we also had, um, you know, apprentices that we had trained. Uh, that were ready to go on their own. So we were like, okay, let's go ahead and just expand. And so that's really what led to it, you know, um, and I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I will tell you is I always appreciated the people that worked with me, but I didn't appreciate them as much as I did. And so I started going out in the rest of the world and seeing how people did thing and the cultures and the backfighting. And, you know, I'm really blessed in my career that I've had, had some, I got to work with some amazing young people, both men and women. Mm. So, you said uh, earlier that you had young techs training other young techs. Um, yeah. That's kind of a unique and different thing. Did you, uh, what was the, what was the reason why you did that? Um, just because I knew there was a staffing shortage, right? I knew there was a staffing shortage and I knew that a lot of people, you know, um, a lot of people did not know that, you know, I don't know how can I say this. There was a staffing shortage and I didn't believe in stealing fish from another man's pond. Right. I apologize. That was my door ringing bell. I'm sorry. No worries. So, um, so, you know, again, uh, I didn't believe in stealing fish from another man's pond. And there were a lot of people that were, um, you know, wanted to get into the trade and they wanted to work at a really good quality shop. Right. 
and I just want to provide that opportunity for them. And, you know, another thing we did was that we brought a lot of people over on what's called a J-1 work visa mm -hmm. from Europe. And uh, so, you know, I'm sure like maybe when you were in high school, you probably had some like high school exchange students. So what we did is we, um, you can bring people over from foreign countries on a work exchange program. So we brought a lot of people over on a J-1 work visa through a program called AIPT, Association for International Practical Training, where we uh, brought people over from Denmark, Germany, France, and England. So we had the ability to, um, you know, to bring them over and then work. And then we also ran the Skills USA contest for like skills usa or votech so what we did was we used to run that um for like the state of virginia and the state of maryland as well as a bunch of local high schools and so we would have those contests at our shop because it was a central location and then people would see you know we worked on porsches and mercedes etc and then so it just it wasn't something i set out to do it just kind of happened did that make sense no actually um it really does i there was something that i learned when i was training people myself in one of my former businesses and it, it just kind of came to me all of a sudden when um i found out that the best way to learn your craft is to train someone else yeah i agree there's you, there's a saying and i apologize somebody rang my doorbell and it distracted me there for a moment so i apologize no worries, um no but you know yeah there's a saying that says to teach is to learn twice mm -hmm. and i've always embraced that right to teach is to learn twice. But also in fairness, um, I was really blessed with a lot of technicians and estimators and, and customer service reps that work for me who actually found it gratifying to teach other young people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something again that it just, I mean, and there were a lot of things that led to that. So to back up a little bit. So when I, when my dad and I were partners, the property was paid for so we had no rent wow and my dad was brought up during the depression era where everything that you bought you paid cash for so we didn't buy a frame machine or paint booth we could pay cash for it well when i bought my dad out in 2010 now all of a sudden i've got to pay my dad rent because that's part of his income and in retirement i also had to get a loan so i had to pay the loan where i bought the business from my dad right so i couldn't do the same amount of sales right and still be profitable. I had to do more in sales because now I have a rent expense and I have to pay my dad. And then I had to also hire someone to replace the things that my dad did around the business, like you know, fix a spray booth and stuff. So at the end of the day, um, we were just in an 8,000 square foot building, which mm -hmm. is not that big, right? And so at that time, we were doing a lot of Audis and Porsches. And when I bought my dad out of the business, my dad also took all the money out of the bank with him. So now I don't have any money for cash flow. <laughs> And when you're doing an Audi that's at that time, you know, keep in mind this is in 2002, you know, you could have a $24,000 Audi estimate or Porsche and you got all this money tied up in parts and I didn't have cash flow because I didn't have, you know, I didn't have the money my dad had, right? So what happened was I had to figure out how to fix cars faster without sacrificing quality. And I found the best way to do that was to have like a team or a cell of people that would work on a car together so I could turn that car quicker so that really, it was survival that led to us having apprentices that worked under our technicians. I don't know if that story makes sense to you or not. No, no, actually, that that is uh, great. That's that's actually genius. And uh, this might be a very ignorant question, but no, no you know, just like <laughs> just yeah, like no, you, uh, this the, that thing that you said where you had twenty four grand and an estimate tied up in parts and everything like that. And I'm let's say like your average repair. Uh, before your optimizations was two, three weeks ish, something like that. Right. Yeah. Well, it would take a month to fix. Like, you know, you had like a, a, let's say you had like a Mercedes or, you know, an Audi and it's getting two quarter panels and a rear body panel. Just use that as a really far stretch, ex, you know, example. I mean, that could, if one person to do that job start to finish, it could take you a month. Okay. Yeah. And, you so, know, and I know when you got like two of those or three, now your money's tied up in labor and parts and you don't get that till you get done with it, right? It wasn't like today where they give you EFTs to go in your bank account. So I had to figure out how can I fix those hard hits faster without sacrificing quality. So what I figured out was is that I could have, you know, like a technician with two apprentices working under them and you got like one person taking a, the left rear door apart, another person taking the right door apart. You know what I mean? And so again, it was not sacrificing quality but doing it in a way that we could increase throughput, you know, 
and be more efficient. And we just found that if we had more people working on a car together as a team, whether it was assembly or reassembly, things would go faster. And the thing is, is that in the collision repair industry, people have done that for years with painters, right? Painters and preppers, right? And they always had preppers working under them, but nobody had really done it in the, in the technician side. So when we did that, we found that number one is we turn cars quicker without sacrificing quality, cash flow improved, if we could fix a car faster and get it out the door, we could get other cars in sooner. So sales went up, but it also created us building a, a pipeline of future technicians and building our bench because your business is only as strong as your bench, right? Like you look at a, like a sports team or in football season now, right? And your star quarterback goes down, you know, what, how good your backup quarterback determines where you make it. So it just, you know, what's that saying? Necessity is the mother of all invention, right? And so at the end of the day, it really forced us to figure out how to become more efficient. And I wanna say this over and over again without sacrificing quality, right? Like we only used OEM parts, we didn't use aftermarket parts, right? We were you know, totally, we were ranked the number one shop 33 years in a row. Um, we used to fix like, um, you know, Armani, you know, the Armani, we used to fix his cars. We did work for Michael Jordan. We did a lot of high luxury clientels. Being outside of Washington DC, we did a lot of politicians cars, but we also fixed you know, Mary Jane who owned the Toyota Camry as her car, right? So, but we didn't want to sacrifice quality. That was just, and again, I'll give you a little bit more, maybe I'm rambling too much, but I'll tell you what led me to not sac to not ever want to sacrifice quality. So my dad was in the military and um, he was in during the Vietnam era and my dad uh, was in the airborne and my dad jumped out of an airplane and his parachute didn't open all the way. And my dad streamlined to the ground and it broke both his legs and his back. Mm. He was in Walter Reed Hospital for two years. And they found out the reason my dad's parachute malfunctioned is because somebody didn't pack his parachute properly, right? They did not pack his parachute properly. And so my dad was injured his whole life. He had to live with injuries because somebody didn't do their job properly in regards to quality. So that lesson stayed with me that I never wanted to sacrifice quality in my shop because basically when we fix someone's car, we're packing their parachute. So I don't know if that analogy makes sense or not, but when no, I fix your that's, car- that's a great analogy. And that's what I would say to anybody listening to this podcast is, you know, who's packing the parachute? And what quality control, you know, procedures or processes do you have in place to ensure that the parachute was packed properly? Yeah, the one question I had um, was, going back to kind of the cash flow part when previously to your optimizations and everything like that were shops uh floating this cash because they just had that much cash sitting in a checking account or was well, it pretty typical you, to use like a line of credit and no i think of, i think you had a lot of old school guys like my dad that grew up during that depression era and they just truly you know they only paid you know they only bought what they could pay cash for or there were companies that would finance stuff, you know, it wasn't uncommon for people to finance a spray booth or an Audi frame machine, you know, for Audi or certifications or like that. So I think there were people that probably just finance things. Um, I think there probably were some people that got credit lines, you know, and, and in these days, a lot of paint companies will give you what's called prebates or like upfront discount or cash. You know, that didn't exist back in those days. So I think that's also what drove people like my father who started out in the business to do you know, side work and stuff, just trying to make cash so they could get ahead, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, one of the lessons my dad taught me that I think every young business owner needs to know is it's not how much you make, it's how much you spend. Like a lot of people are like, you know, man, if I could just make, you know, this much more a week, then I'd save more money. But as soon as they make more, they go out and buy a bigger car, a bigger house, whatever the case may be. And so at the end of the day, it's not what you make, it's what you spend. And so I think that back in those days, there were probably some financing companies, right, that did it, and not necessarily credit lines. Um, there may have been, but I think they were probably a little bit rarer. And you didn't have like the upfront paint co company money you have today. So I think it was just like you had to figure out like how can I get this car done quickly because I need, you know, I've got to have it, you know. Yeah. And back then, I don't think you know you couldn't like you know run up your credit cards as much back then either, right? Now in the '90s and 2000s. People started getting credit lines. They started getting upfront paint money. They started getting credit cards with large limits on them, right? But I think sometimes that also, when it's easy for you to do that, it makes it very easy for you to get yourself in trouble and over your head, you know, which puts you in a bad spot financially. 
Hey guys, Adam from the podcast. I hope you are enjoying today's episode. Just wanted to ask you a quick favor. If the show has brought you value in some way, would you mind giving us a review and sharing the show? It really helps the show get out there. Also, if you are looking to expand the services that your shop offers and you want to do more than collision work, you should really check out our company, Clarity Coat. Clarity Coat is a peelable paint that allows body shops to offer color changes cheaper than a repaint while still looking like real paint. You can also offer clear protection that has no edges and is sprayed instead of laid. Unlike vinyl and PPF, Clarity Coat can be sanded and polished, so you can give your customer the exact look that they are wanting. If you are looking to expand your shop services, go to claritycoat.com and fill out our Become an Installer form. All right, let's get back to the show. So moving forward to, did you say, uh, well, I guess it says uh, 2010, you officially start um, Collision Advice. You, you sold the shops, yes. you start Collision Advice. Um, now, I, I think you had kind of mentioned it, but I'm just going to go ahead and maybe put some words in your mouth that the reason why one of your primary drivers for doing that was because of the satisfaction that you got mm -hmm. out of helping other shops become just as optimized, efficient, and and getting having getting on the road to having as much success as you did. Um, what were some of those first couple of years like? Like, how did you? How did you kind of expand out, get yourself known to some you of the shops? For collision, go, for collision Advice, you mean? Yep, for Collision Advice. Um, so when I owned my shops, number one is um, when Elena Satchery asked me to do a seminar and never done one before, um, uh, there was a guy named Bruce Cooley that at the time worked for Sherm Williams and later worked for DuPont and then Exalta. He said, hey, would you do some training for us, right? So I'd, I'd do like a seminar once a every three months or something if somebody asked me right and then what happened was um, I was reading a magazine article one day in one of the trade publications and I felt like I didn't necessarily agree with the viewpoint that was expressed in the trade publication so I wrote like a letter to the editor and then they said um, explain more about what you mean and I did that and then they just said hey would you like to like start writing some articles for us and I was like sure so I started writing some articles and then you know, people would see my name. And then as I started doing estimate seminars, again, while I had my shops, you know, people would see me in a seminar or, um, and then because we were also Audi certified and Porsche, and we did some unique things in our business with what we called the team or the cell system I was telling you about with like people as a team, we're just started to kind of travel. And then people would call me and say, hey, can I come look at your shop? And I'd be like, sure, come on and see my shop, right? And then people would say, hey, can you come help me implement this in my shop? And again, it wasn't something I sought out to do. It just kind of organically happened through word of mouth, I guess, for lack of a better word. Did you, in those uh, in those days, I mean, I'm guessing forums and everything like that were kind of on their way and well nace was really big back then like you know sema today is the show everybody goes to right nace doesn't even exist but back then nace was the show to go to right and i mean it was just all body shop you know not like with sema is where it's different stuff right so you know i got the opportunity to speak at nace and then people heard me at nace and then it just get getting grew people would say hey can you come to my town and speak and you know and i would do that right and um so again, it was through writing articles for magazines. It was just getting out there and speaking. And, and a lot of times I don't think people understand, like when you speak at like NACE or SEMA, you know, you don't get paid for that. You're doing it for your love of the industry to give back, right? And I think it just helped me to build my brand. But also I think the fact was that, you know, there are a lot of people that are consultants and this isn't meant to be right or wrong, right? There's just a lot of people that are consultants that actually haven't owned a shop, right? Like until you've laid in bed at night and try to figure out how am I gonna cover payroll this week, to you live that it's it's sometimes hard you know those life lessons kind of mold your presentation style right yeah um yeah. so yeah i would say just it just kind of grew because speaking at events and then people saw me or read an article i wrote and and again our shop was you know again i'm very fortunate i want to give thanks to god but also my employees right that people would want to come to our shop we used to do a ton of shop tours i mean we had people who would fly in I mean, I still have photos. When my dad passed away in May, we were going through a bunch of old photo albums. And, like, we had people from, uh, like, South Korea that came and toured our shop. People from Japan that came and toured our shop. So it was, like, globally people would come to our shop, right? So because we were just known for quality work and customer service. And, and, again, the way we did some things was somewhat unique. 
in those in those early days when you had people coming to your shop and or you know you're talking at conferences and stuff like that do you have guys calling you out and saying there's no way you're fixing a car that fast and doing it correctly yeah. um, because you know in one of the previous businesses that i had i totally agree with you just because efficiency just because you're efficient at something doesn't necessarily mean that it's not um to the same quality level Correct. and I mean, I had to battle some of these same exact accusations where, you know, you tell someone, you know, you get a vehicle done in so much time and they just go, oh, yeah, okay. Well, what corners did you cut? You know, yep. type Heard of thing. That. Um, is, that, is that something where you just kind of brushed it off or, and or did you tell them like, no, actually, this is the way I do it and then so you need to try I, it? I think the fact that people would come to my shop and they would see our quality of work. And once they saw the quality of work, they were like, oh, now I get it, right? You know, what's that saying? A picture's worth a thousand words, right? And when I built my second shop, we actually built a training room on the second level that would hold about 100 people. Wow. We built a big training room. So it, wasn't, it was pretty common for me to do training classes there, and they could walk into my shop and see my technicians working. They could talk to my team, my estimators. They could see the quality of the work that we did. You know, so, uh, you know, it just made believers. And then, you know, people's word starts to travel and people are just like, Hey, I've been to Mike Anderson's shop and they do do everything they say they're going to do. You know what I mean? So it just starts to, it just starts to grow. I think it's just doing the right thing. Right. I, I will tell you, if you do the right thing in this work in the, in the industry, people will hear about it, you know, cause a paint rep will come in, a parts person will come in and they'll be like, Oh my God, you need to see this shop. Right. Um, I, I use a shop, like there's a shop in uh, Hickory, North Carolina called K and M uh, Michael and Kyle Bradshaw and their family. And like, I mean, you know, they're not out there self-promoting themselves. They run a body shop and they're been there every day. But everybody in the industry knows that they run some of the most best quality work in the entire country, right? And I can vouch for that because I've been to their shop. Same thing with like Kai Young out in California, right? Like people start to hear about the shops that do things right, you know, because, you know, paint companies will want to, they, you know, if a paint company is wanting to get a prospective customer, they want to take them to a shop that's, that does great work to make their product look good. So, you know, it starts to travel just with equipment vendors, whatever. They're like, go see this shop, right? And again, we're it's probably even easier today because back then there wasn't like internet or anything, you know? So. The internet is both a blessing and an absolute it curse. Is. It absolutely <laughs> is. It absolutely is. Um, okay, so collision device, uh, I mean, you. it sounds like you kind of already hit the ground running. You already had a good reputation built up. So 2010, you know, there's probably doesn't seem like there's a lot of work that you need to do to build up your reputation and why well, people should hire you well it was just me at the time right so i was just collision advice and um mark claypool who owns optima automotive uh, they do websites um he had done my website for my body shops and i was like i need to come up with a name so i got to give credit to him he's the one that came up with the name and the logo but it was just tiffany and i right so you know i just went out there and you know started doing it and then um uh then i got the opportunity to meet a wonderful young lady by the name of tracy dombrowski um she's an instructional designer who builds course curriculum and she'd built course curriculum for like Coors beer company and and like 3m and like new holland equipment and so she, she knows like, her she, stuff like <laughs> yeah i mean like that was her her she was a professional who built course curriculum and i was just doing like xerox copies on a copy machine for my workbooks it wasn't anything that was like professional right it was my passion that carried me but I had the opportunity to work on a joint project with her for um, one of the paint companies at the time, it was DuPont. And I met her and I was like, oh my gosh, when I saw her stuff, I was like, my stuff sucks so bad. <laughs> and so Tracy um, at that time lived in Denver, Colorado because her husband was in the military. And then they got, he retired and he got, well, right before he retired, he got transferred to Alexander, Virginia. So she was local. So then she joined our team and then we started working together. And then it was just her and I and Tiffany. And then uh, we had the opportunity where um, um, Toyota Lexus um, found out some of the training we're doing and said, hey, would you do all of our estimate training? And then another OEM reached out, um, Nissan Infinity, and we're like, okay, we need to find somebody else. So then we hired somebody, and and now you look at us now, and we're like I said, we're at um, uh, 10 employees, and actually um, we've made offers to two other employees, so we'll probably be at 12 employees by next week. And again, it's just kind of grown. And, uh, you know, it's, while it's painful to grow any business, just like me trying to grow this business, right. It's no different than trying to grow a body shop. Right. Um, you know, it's just gratifying for me because I just, you know, want to make sure that I leave a legacy for other people that can carry on my values even after I'm gone. Right. Which hopefully is no time. 
anytime soon. But but yeah, Collision Advice, I was already doing training seminars and I was doing 20 groups actually for DuPont at the time too. When I sold my shops, I was doing four 20 groups. Wow, so, I wow. mean, even when I had my shops, I was on the road about 200 days a year. And I just had great people that oversaw my shops, right? Like Heather Schmoyer and Chris Browning. I mean, I had some, you know, some really awesome people that, that worked with me that oversaw the shops, Lindsay Moore. Um, and so they would just, things ran great. And so people say, well, why did you sell your business if it would run without you? The biggest thing was that, um, you know, my mom and dad were getting older and, um, I knew that if I sold, I could just pay them off in full and they could go out there and really enjoy their life. And a year after I sold, my mom passed away. So in hindsight, it was a great decision, mm-hmm. right? When I missed my team, it was a great decision for my mom and dad's benefit. So, um, you know, uh, that's kind of what led me to, to sell and, Again, I just hit the ground running. I mean, you know, I, I, before COVID, I was on the road. In 2019, I was on the road 344 days. Uh, this year, I will be on the road about 321 days. So, I mean, wow. I mean, I got home today from Wisconsin, and I leave out on Monday, and I'm gone for two weeks straight. So, but again, I, I do what I do because I love it, and I love working with people. It's not because, you know, I'm getting rich, um, like people may believe. It's just I just love what I do, and I love helping people, so you you came back home simply for this podcast right like it was yeah. just it was top priority absolutely, <laughs> sure, sure. absolutely. Uh, that, that was one of the reasons for sure um you know we've had we've had uh, one other guest on before I, I forget who it was who kind of talked a little bit about 20 groups as well now for someone who's listening that doesn't know what a 20 group is or you know whatever what first of all would you mind explaining what a 20 group is and then secondly what is the power of someone joining a 20 group? Like what, why should someone do that? So a 20 group, um, is where ideally 20 shop owners or managers, uh, meet together that are not competitors. So they're not competitors, right? They're usually from different States and they get together on a quarterly basis. So four times a year for two days, and they benchmark financials and they compare marketing ideas and they exchange ideas, right? So it's really like a peer to peer group where you're in there with people that aren't your competitors so that you can share your financials and you can see, well, they're making 47% gross profit and you're only making 43. What are they doing you can learn from, right? And so, you know, to me, the value of a 20 group is learning from other people, it's the camaraderie. It's knowing that if something, you know, you have a challenge, you got some people like some brothers and sisters in arms you can call and get some advice from. You know, every paint company, um, Exalta, PPG, BSF, Axel Nobel, Sherman Williams, they all do 20 groups for shops. Um, you also have independent companies that do uh, 20 groups like the Coyote Vision Group. Um, I do 20 groups also that are called the Spartan 300 20 group. Um, so, you know, some of your OEMs like Toyota Lexus have 20 groups. So. A, tw- and a lot of dealerships do 20 groups, but again, a 20 group is where 20 business owners or managers, because like if you work for a dealership shop, you might be a manager, not an owner. So 20 owners or managers get together, usually for two days, and they exchange ideas and they benchmark their performance against other shops that are not competitors of theirs. So it could be customer satisfaction, CSI benchmarks, it could be estimating benchmarks, it could be financial benchmarks, it could be expenses, it could be gross profit. It could be cycle time or length of rental benchmarks. So, you know, just it's it's just finding a peer-to-peer group with somebody that's not a competitor that you can say, hey, how do I stack up and measure up against other people? And then it's just the networking and collaboration. It, it sounds like you've been a part of these groups for quite some time. Is there a success story of someone joining one of these groups that really stands out in your mind as in like, you you know, someone, someone came in and it was like just a complete wreck of a shop, like barely making it, blah, blah, blah. And then because of joining that group, they just really turned it around. There's a lot of those stories. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to share anyone's name because I wouldn't want to embarrass them. Right. You know, that was like, but I mean, I've had businesses that joined that were on the verge of going out of business. Right. And they joined and we got their business turned around. And of course they have to put the work in and we can't just do it for them and, and happy success stories. But I can also tell you like, um, Matt McDonald at big sky collision. Uh, when I started working with him, he had one shop, he grew to five shops and then he sold to crash champions, but he went from one to five shops. Wow. Uh, Matt wouldn't Matt Wittenberger deal automotive, a dealership group. 
um, in uh, Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh, has gone, since I've been working with them, they've gone from one shop to seven shops, you know, seven locations. Um, you know, Ryan Cropper, um, Anchorage, Alaska, he went from one shop to three shops, and then he sold a classic. Um, but, you know, also these men and women, when they sold, they did very, very well for themselves financially. Um, you know, I've got, you know, um, Grant and Shannon Sunday in Olathe, Kansas, you know, gone from one shop to two shops. Paul and Anna Christensen in uh, Savannah and just Georgia and also in, um, in South Carolina, um, Okadie and Walter Water, Boros, I think it's called. They've gone from one shop to three shops. Um, I know, I mean, I, I could, the list goes on. I mean, we probably deal with over 300 shops in our 20 groups, so it's a pretty big list. Is is there a metric or a thing that these shops, when they come onto these 20 groups, is almost always the thing that they're missing? Is it standard operating procedure that they mm. they just really don't have nailed down, or is it expenses running away from them? Like I think it is that I think that 99 percent of business owners don't understand their financials, mm. right? There's a, a great book called The E Myth Manager Revisited by Michael Gerber, and he talks about people. You know, you're supposed to delegate, but most people abdicate, right? And they abdicate their financials, the thing that they're probably the least comfortable with. And they just hire somebody and say, do my bookkeeping. And next thing you know, the vendors are calling up and saying, hey, you know, nobody's paid me, right? And so what's going on? And I think, you know, what happens is, you know, if you look at the book, The E-Myth Manager, revisited by Michael Gerber, he talks about people having an entrepreneurial seizure. So like you're a body tech or an estimator, and you're like, I don't, I don't want to work for myself. And you go start a business, and you gravitate towards what you're comfortable with, like it's fixing cars or writing estimates or whatever. And you tend to ask somebody else to do the things that's not your comfort zone. And I would say the biggest thing that I think most people get the value out of from 20 groups is they understand their financials, right? Like if you owned your own body shop and I said, hey, how do you quality control inspect your body technician? You'd be like, I check the door handles, the lights, the gaps, fit and finish. How do you quality control inspect your painter? Well, I make sure the paint matches, there's no dirt nibs, et cetera. Okay, cool. How do you quality control inspect your bookkeeper? And then you just get silence. So I think the biggest value that people get from 20 groups is understanding their financials, how their chart of accounts should be set up, accounts and sub accounts and GL codes, how to do work and process adjustments or what's called whip adjustments. So it's not like they made a whole lot of money one month and no money the next month and it's inconsistent. So I think financials is probably the, the single best thing. I mean, there's other things as well, you know, whether it's improving estimatic accuracy or, you know, increased average hours for severity or profitability, all that matters. But the baseline that every business owner needs to know is they need to understand their financials, right? That should help to guide some of their decisions. I think I've read E-Myth twice now. Yeah, it's uh, awesome book. It's, it, it really is. It's, it's a book that the great thing about it is, is that you will get something different out of it. De depending on how many years you've been in business, you read it year yeah. one, you're going to get something out of it. You read right. it year three, you're going to get something different out of it. And the, what I'm hearing from you is uh, it's it's fine to have a bookkeeper or an accountant, but you need to know enough to be dangerous about those financials. You need to know like, okay, my, my supplies or my uh, materials or whatever should really only be about this percentage. Right, yeah, and exactly. We, we call that sales mix, right? Like, you know, like 30% of your sales should be body frame and mechanical labor. You know, like 15 to 17% of your sales should be paying labor. So it's understanding those sales percentages, but also understanding the margins. Like what are the, what are the margins, you know, for, you know, like what are your margins and what they should be? You know, so a lot of people, they only use a profit and loss to determine whether they're making money or losing money. They never use it to figure out if they're maximizing their profits. So you might say you're making 25% GP on parts, but maybe you should be making 28 or 30%. And that's why you really got to know how to dial into there. You got to know how to do a comparative analysis to make sure expenses are booked out the right month. So when you export a profit and loss to Excel, you're looking at it as month to date, year to date, percentage of income, you know, and understanding how to move the numbers, right? Like if your sales mix is only at like 12% on paint labor and you want it to be 17%, how do I move that number, right? Is it coding? Is it estimate accuracy? I mean, you know, it's just understanding that, but you're absolutely right. Most people... They, they need, to, and listen, I'm not saying you gotta like numbers, but you gotta know what to look for, right? Because I can give you stories of where uh, I, I had a client where um, their grandmother stole $80,000 from him in one year. His grandmother was his bookkeeper. Um, I can give you examples where children stole from their parents, right? I mean, 
I mean, I'm not saying you don't trust people, but you trust but verify, right? Especially yep, when it comes yep. to your bank account, because that can get you in trouble real quick. And your Plus, grandmother. If you, yeah, especially when grandma <laughs> steals from you, right? But I think also, you know, you got to learn how to do a pro forma, right? Like how to build a budget so you can build a budget, you know, and that's one thing I credit a lot of dealerships with is they kind of understand a little bit more about building pro formas and budgets. But, you know, before you buy a piece of equipment, like, hey, I'm trying to decide if I should buy a four-wheel alignment machine. Well, let's kind of do some projections and see what the ROI would be on that based on what your payment's going to be, right? And so uh, I, I think I just can't say enough about people understanding their financials. Yeah, totally agree. Um, the one really interesting thing about the body shop industry, from what you're saying, it sounds like there's there's a lot of areas where tightening up a couple of percentage points really pays um it just pays out huge at the end of a, of a week of a month or whatever and there's a lot of little areas where there needs to be some fine tuning and tightening up you've got parts labor but not only in labor but you got your different stages of labor r and i painting what um even i'm sure front office and everything like that right. is there a common spot where people are missing the biggest percentage um, and I mean, most people, needs the most optimizing? Yeah, I mean, I would say labor is a percentage of sales. Most people, you know, I'm I, like, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but most, most people are writing really bad estimates, right? Repair plans, blueprint, whatever you want to call it. They're not writing an accurate estimate. It's not that the insurance company won't pay for certain things. Now, I give it, I get it, right? There are certain things the insurance company is going to fight you tooth and nail for and they don't want to pay. But most people, the things they leave off estimates is not stuff that insurance companies would push back on. It's just they're not educated, right? And so what happens is, I would say estimate quality. You know, people just aren't writing a, an accurate estimate. And then they're just trying to make it up by doing volume, right? And then when you're trying to push volume, your quality starts to suffer, right? So uh, I would say estimate quality is probably the number one thing. You know, mm -hmm. just not writing, not capturing all the labor hours on an estimate, right? I... I'm just making a total shot in the dark here, but um, it sounds like you're working with a lot of like independent shops versus um, MSOs. No I, work with, no, I work with a lot of regional MSOs. You um, do? Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, work with, I work with independents and I work with, re I don't work with like the national chains like Caliber and Gerber and those guys, but I work with a lot of regional MSOs. Like I have one MSO, um, regional MSO, he's got seven locations. I have another one that has 16 locations. I have another one that's got uh, nine locations so i mean i work with some regionals right and some of those are independents and some of them are dealerships so i work with single shops that are dealers or independents and then i work with regional msos so it, all the above is the is the msos are are they the ones that they typically have these finances and everything like that a little bit more no. tightened up than no. the independents you, you, you would think that and that's not true interesting yeah yeah it's um i mean it's just that sometimes people just sometimes people have been successful despite themselves you know what i mean they've just grown despite themselves and and uh you know and, and i'm not saying and, and i don't think there's a, a broad brush you can say everybody falls in this category there are some msos that are very dialed in and have you know cfos that do a great job right and then you have some that have just grown so fast that they didn't have a chance to really keep control and keep you know hands on that yeah um with uh collision advice are you guys typically do is is your is your mixture typically like these 20 groups and like the Toyota and um, estimating and everything like that? Or is it still a good mix of like doing independent um, shops or let's say regional shops where Man, you're going are, in and optimizing? We're, so I would say so, you know, I would say a, a third of our business. Well, actually, no, I would say I would say a fifth of our business is 20 groups a fifth a fifth of our business is doing training for car manufacturers a fifth of our business is on shop in shop consulting a fifth of our business is um probably going to be um um like doing seminars across the country um like for people like i do what's called a day with mike and friends or doing like a class on 100% disassembly or, or cla a class on, you know, parts overhauls, right? Like classes on that. And then I would say the other fifth part of our income 
is we do a lot of financial consulting. So we have uh, three people on our team, um, including myself. Uh, we have Marquette and uh, Sheryl Driggers and Maria Quintero that all know like, you know, accounting inside and out. They know the body shop management system, CCC, PropaNet, Nexius, Summit, Rome. And then we know like QuickBooks and BusinessWorks and just how to set up a chart of accounts and do all that. So, you know, that's another part of our business that, and that it's that it's the financial and then our coaching model. So like on the 20 groups we do, we actually do coaching calls with the clients every single week. So every single week we do a coaching call and help people work on their business. So I would say, you know, uh, you know, we have like basically five different like revenue streams for our business, right? 20 groups and training are probably the two biggest though. And training is then broken down into estimatics training, financial training, parts training, customer service training. So did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, and you know, uh, the question was not trying to pry into personal, nope, you know, nope. like how, how you guys make money or anything like that. The, the question that I, w the reason why I was asking that is because I am always very interested in the several people that we've had on the podcast. There's a lot of people listening to this podcast. And, and one of the reasons why I started the podcast is a lot of the older gentlemen in the industry are not going to listen to podcasts. 45 and older or whatever, you know, it's just not their thing, right? It's typically the younger guys that are going to be coming into the industry sure. that it, it appears that they're they consume information by a different means, right? YouTube podcasts, yeah. you know, whatever. And so this podcast almost serves as kind of like a future proof for these guys that are wanting to know how they can get better at something. Mm -hmm. And, and it's just there waiting for them. Right. So one of my, one of my questions I love to ask about cons with consultants or people that come onto the podcast that are in that realm is, you know, the average person that's listening to this podcast either now or in the future it's funny how problems are seem to always repeat themselves it's it's almost yeah. always the same problem just in a slightly different form sure what is a i mean you've kind of already answered this question a little bit so i apologize if it's, if it's a little bit repetitive yeah. but it's it, the answer has been almost resoundingly across the board estimating seems to be the one thing that people can tighten up but is training and um, efficiencies in a shop something that you also see oh, as like something that absolutely. is yeah. a I mean, there's huge a, lacking? Yeah, the, the number one thing that shops struggle with today is staffing, right? People don't have enough people. And so I think training is number one. You got to figure out how do you... So like every year when I go around the country and I speak, I pick a theme. And my theme for this year is grow your team to grow your business and change the way you compete. Grow your team to grow your business. Everybody has cars to fix. What everybody doesn't have is people. Mm -hmm. So it's not who gets the cars, it's who gets the people. So culture, number one, is important. You gotta have an amazing culture where people don't love their job, they love the organization they work for, right? I think number two is you gotta offer flexible work hours, like you know, four day work weeks. But I think you gotta figure out how do you take your existing staff and help them to get better at what they do? How do you help that CSR learn to be an estimator? How do you help that prepper learn to be a painter? But then you also got to have a career path and a training track. So when you hire somebody brand new, there's a structured approach on how to get them up to speed so you don't take seven years to train them. And you're not training them on whatever the hot issue is of the day, but you actually have a structured path to that, right? So, you know, I would say, you know, training is really important. And I think you, you absolutely have to invest in training, right? Whether it's with ICAR, whether it's with customer service training, with it's sending your bookkeeper to QuickBooks school, if it's, you know, um, paint training, if it's estimate training. And, and yes, while estimate quality is really, really tough, I mean, you know, the other thing is, is it's not just estimate quality that needs to be fixed. It's also technicians that can fix the cars. Because again, everybody has a backlog of work, but they don't have people. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem like you subscribe to the idea that people should just be happy to have a job and, and show up and be happy to just get paid. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I think that, you know, people have to feel appreciated. And again, you know, you, you want people that don't just love their job, they love the organization. You want people that love the company they work for, right? I mean, that's really what it is. I mean, and there, cause there's a difference, right? There's a difference between loving my job, love being a body tech versus loving to be a body tech at this shop, right? And that's really what your goal is. You gotta make your place a place where people love to work. 
And I don't think everybody does that. I think we burn people out a lot in our industry. I think we don't show people appreciation. I think we everybody think everybody's motivated by money, and that's not true. There's a great book called The Five Languages of Appreciation by Dr. Chapman. It talks about everybody has a primary way that they feel most appreciated. And I think also when you reward people, like if you just give them money and they spend it, then they don't remember that. So you want to reward them in ways that creates a lasting memory. Like I have a dealership client in Canada uh, and uh, what they do is like, let's say you do a really good job. I mean, they'll pay you fairly, but they'll also try to give you, reward you in a way that's memorable. Like they'll pay somebody to clean your house every week for you for a month, right? Like that leaves an impression. That's something you're gonna go tell everybody about or your wife's gonna go tell everybody about. Like, oh my God, my husband's boss paid somebody to clean our house every week for a month. And then the next time you gotta call your wife and say, honey, I gotta work late. She's like, I don't care what you gotta do as long as he gets somebody to clean our house again, right? So, you know, I think you gotta think about people feel appreciated and rewarded differently, right? You know, you might have a, somebody that's, you know, gets into their 60s and or late 50s and their house is paid for and their kids are out of college and they're just worried about quality time, right? So offering them, you know, like a three-day work week. I mean, in my shop, everybody that worked for me got um, one Friday off every month and we closed at one o'clock every Friday because we're really big about quality of life. And I, I will tell you, some of my most successful clients actually have four-day work weeks and then just, you have like that, everybody rotates working one Friday a month so there's somebody there in case a customer has a problem. Uh, where he needs to pick up or deliver, but everybody else is getting 40 work weeks and it just helps morale, you know, and, and keeps people able to avoid burnout, right? So, yeah, I don't subscribe to that. I, I believe that people got to feel appreciated and I think people got to love the organization. Like, they got to love collision advice if they work with me, right? Yeah. There's a, there's a bit of an age gap between you and I and... I'll be 60 this year. <laughs> and... It, it was always interesting to me that when I was younger, or even really right now, I mean a little less now, but the common theme when I was younger was that my generation was entitled, that we just, we wanted um, pizza days and everything like that. And it wasn't until later that I realized, um, so I figured out when I was 25 that I couldn't, I just couldn't work for other people. It just wasn't gonna work out, right? Yeah. and. I, I, I've told this story before, but I'll tell you this to, because I want to try and help the people understand that you're right. It's not about money. It's it, and it's not about getting pizza days. It it can be something. It can be something very. It it can be free, honestly. And so, f as an example for myself, one of the things that I hated was I worked at a shop where. Uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I w used to work for a construction company as a diesel tech, and I had 85 trucks that they were my trucks. Like they, I, was, I was responsible for them. But not only was I responsible for them, I was responsible for the truck drivers to be able to drive that day. And if they didn't drive that day, they didn't get paid that day, right? So I came up with this system where the truck drivers would get there at 5 o'clock in the morning, and we didn't get there until 7. Well, if a truck broke down, that meant that it was at least – three hours before I even got out to the truck to even start the repair. Right. Right. So what I did was, um, this is when I was like 23, 22, something like that. I gave every truck driver my number and I said, I'm getting up at four 30 in the morning from now on. If there's a problem with the truck, I will come in and fix it. And then I'll figure out the billing and all that stuff later on. Right. <laughs> well, I moved to a different shop and all of a sudden that got taken away from me. And now it was what is exactly, I would say, 99% of what shops the, the, the flow is, which is the tech is disconnected from the customer. Right. The, the tech just fixes whatever, never meets, never talks to, and never has to either get the praise and or the negative feedback from the customer when they do a good or bad job. And I hated that. I, I hated the fact that everything fell onto my manager's shoulders, good or bad, and it was never my fault or I never got the praise for it. And when this struck me was when I had my business and my my guys felt the exact same way. They I had a guy tell me one day, Oh, it must be nice to get all the um to get all the glory for all of our hard right. work. And I was like, Oh, okay now i get it like that's that's what it was for me and so then i all all i simply did was just have the guys come out with me when i was walking around the car with the customer and 
then the customer give them the feedback at the same time and then eventually i just let them do that right now you don't want to let just your tech just run wild with them right but there's some training that can happen with that yeah. like hey you know this is what we do in these situations blah 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 it can be as something as simple as that and that changed the whole dynamic of how we treated customers and how agree. we treated situations um all the way around yeah i think if a customer comes to pick up their car and they're like oh my god i love my car i love my car you're like hey hold on a minute and you go and you get chris and you say hey this is chris he's the technician fixed your car here's mark the guy that painted your car they really deserve the credit and then walk away and just let them bask in the glory without you being there right you know i know when uh i don't know how to pronounce his last name dirk Nowinski or whatever his name was that played for um the dallas mavericks right when they won the championship and he got the mvp award that's exactly what he did he deflected all the praise onto his teammates and i think that's why he was appreciated as a leader so I think, yes, we need to deflect, deflect the praise onto our teammates so they want to aspire to replicate that, you know, that appreciation. Yeah, and a lot of, a lot of not everyone, but a lot of guys in the service industry, just all the way around, um, no matter what industry you're in, they love to talk about the work that they perform too. They're like construction workers when they build a new building. Like every time right. you can drive by the building, they want to point it out, right? right? And so think about your tech being out there and saying, yeah, actually, you know, this panel was a was a bear cat. Like, I really had a problem with it, but you know, we got it figured out, and blah blah blah. And then the painter comes in and says, you know, this was this is a really tough color to blend, but you'll see, you know, we we did it right here. Whatever, you know, whatever the thing is, they love to talk about what they're competent at, and right. you know, and customers. I think actually, even though they might not even understand what the heck you're saying, that passion comes through, and and people love that they they love hearing what people are passionate about i agree it's not it's not just another number not just another vehicle um so mike we've eaten up an entire hour amazingly um you know i'm sure it's not difficult to find you but <laughs> where can people find you if they want to get a hold of you uh you know they go to our website www.collisionadvice.com that's www.collisionadvice.com or they can reach out to my assistant, Tiffany, as you did, uh, Tiffany at collisionadvice.com. That's Tiffany at collisionadvice.com. Or they can actually call or text Tiffany at 703-898-0715. Um, and she'll reach out to me. So um, I, I can give people my number, but I travel so much that it's best to go through Tiffany because she knows like if I'm on a plane or teaching a seminar and she'll schedule a call. There's never never a charge to call Uncle Mike at Collision Advice. Uh, we're just here to serve people, and uh, you know. But Tiffany can just schedule a time, and and again, we can talk through what anybody might need, or if I can be a resource or help encourage or assist anyone. Uh, we at Collision Advice would like to do that for the industry. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Mike, for coming. I really do appreciate your time and the you're fact very that honored. you're such a busy guy. So <laughs> no, no, you're very you're very kind. Again, I'm. Very humbled to be on, on your podcast here. And again, I apologize for the distraction with the doorbell. I'm so sorry. Uh, believe me, we've had more distractions than that. So no, <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, all right. Well, I hope you have a great rest of the day and a good weekend. And um, safe travels to on Monday. I appreciate it. And, you know, hey, listen, God bless you and um, all your listeners of your podcast. And we're just praying for your continued success. Thank you. This is the Auto Body Podcast presented by Clarity Code.